Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of Flat Out. Episode 7. Before we begin, though, Joey Labour caught up with Roger Varian, one of Opulence Thoroughbreds trainers, ahead of a big few days at Royal Ascot next week. Thank you very much for joining the podcast, Roger. Um, I, with just a few days to go, I imagine the excitement and nerves are starting to build now. Yeah, it's a, it's a busy week, obviously. And um, thankfully, we're... Uh, you know, we're, we're busy, we're flat out, uh, you know, with the day-to-day runnings of a yard and uh, the training and the looking after the horses. We don't pause too much, um, you know, to get nervous or to get tense. Um, we seem to roll into things, you know, week in, week out, weekend to weekend. And um, we've got to treat Ascot like a, like any other week, you know, preparing horses to run in their, their various targets. But uh, there's always a bit more buzz this week uh, than most weeks leading into Ascot. You know, not just me, the team behind the scenes putting in all the, all the work are very excited and very much looking forward to next week. Do you tend to get nervous ahead of these these big meetings? Or was it just no, uh, not, another meeting not, for you guys? Well, no, I, I, I get nervous five minutes before the race when the jockey's legged up and gone to post and I can't do any more. And, uh, yes. and that's about the the only time I get nervous, you know, the running, when I'm still at the controls, you know, even at the races, you know, saddling the horse in the paddock, um, pretty good. But once the jockey's on and, and, and gone out onto the track and you really can't do any more, that's, that's when, uh, the odd butterfly creeps in. Yeah. The feeling of being a bit out of control at that point. Um, and how's the build up gone for you and the team? Everything gone? Okay. Um, I should think any racehorse trainer would be lying if they, came on and said everything's gone <laughs> smoothly and, and to plan with, with every horse of course uh, you know we live a bit of a roller coaster and there's ups and downs I think largely at the moment and I'm touching wood um, as I speak largely things have gone well um, but we've still got a few days to go before it kicks off and uh, I think nine nine days until Saturday the final day of a meeting so you know quite a long time in most of these horses lives racing lives anyway um in their preparation hopefully we can keep them you know healthy and uh and clean limbed and you know all the horse all the horses with targets next week can can get there and meet their targets but um no i'm happy where they are i think we've got a good team going maybe the largest uh numerical number of horses that we've taken to a royal meeting before so that's exciting and um some nice horses as well so no we're we're ready. We just need uh, the next few days to be as smooth as possible. I know a prominent racing broadcaster says that if a, if a punter knew everything that went on with every single horse, they'd never have a bet. So, you know, I'm sure that it's, it's always quite up and down at this time. They all have little issues, don't they? Um, in terms of opulence, they, they have a nice team of horses with you this year, don't they? I mean, the first one I was interested in is Azure Angel. Is she going to be taking up a, an engagement next week? Yes, uh, Azure Angel is a lovely filly. Um, she will be entered uh, tomorrow, so she'll be entered for the five furlong handicap for three-year-olds on the Friday. I think it's um, the last race, maybe on Friday. Um, I think they call it the Hollywood handicap. And the filly, as your angel, is in good form. She actually worked this morning on the water gallop. She covered five furlongs uh, with a companion, and she worked very well. Uh, she probably got one one more uh, real, real meaningful workout to get through before she lines up at Ascot. But we're very pleased of her. I think that she's a filly uh, with great potential. Um, she looked very promising, very good last year as a two-year-old, winning two of her three starts. Um, she's a three-year-old sprinting filly, and the, the program's quite tough for that type of animal. We've got too many fillies, only sort of handicap options Um so she's got to take on the boys next week, but I think she's capable to hold her own in that company and run a, a good race. And, you know, we'd be um, you know, very excited about her prospects come next week. And dropping down to five furlongs, you don't think that's going to be a problem for her? Well, we hope not. It'll be her first run over the minimum trip, but that's got such a, a fair track and, you know, on the straight course, it's a stiff track. So it's a stiff five furlongs. Um, I would expect her. I would expect to see her finishing strong, and uh, I think she'll run very well. But you know, also it'll only be her fifth career start, and it will give us the opportunity to learn a little bit more about her. I think she fully deserves a place in the lineup, 
um, obviously depending on how she performs, you know, that will shape her uh, and direct us, you know, to with regard to how we're going to campaign her for the rest of the summer. But uh, hopefully she'll run very well and, um, you know, we'll all learn, learn plenty, as will she, I'm sure. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Leah Special is one of my favourite horses that uh, in training with Opulence. And um, you think he can be competitive of a mark of 97? He seems to have a fair bit of improvement left in him, I would have thought. I hope so, yes. I think seven furlongs is his trip. And most likely he'll run in the Buckingham Palace Stakes um, on Thursday. He's in great form. He also did a, a very nice piece of work this morning on the water gallop. Um, we'd hope the rain keeps away for Lee Special. Um, he's best on a sound surface, but I, he, I think he's progressive. I think he's he's shown he's what only raced twice over seven furlongs, winning both starts, and I think uh, he's got the potential to show even more over that trip. So. Uh, fingers crossed he gets he gets to the race in one piece and we get some fast ground to to run him on and I think a race like the Buckingham Palace will set up really well for him. If the rain does come will will, he, will there be another option for him or are you thinking he, about he holds an en- maybe another he, he holds an entry yeah he holds an entry in the Wokingham which would be plan B definitely be plan B um, we'd love to see him over seven furlongs in the Buckingham Palace uh, if we were to line up in the Woken, that would be another conversation. You know, if the track looked like drying, for example, into the weekend, or or he, he, you know, he's in races like the Bunbury Cup at Newmarket in the July meeting. You know, maybe that would yes. be something to to wait for if uh, if the ground was testing the Ascot. So, you know, he's got options, but he's a nice horse, and um, I think uh, he's going to be competitive in these, um, you know, top level class two festival handicaps. So he's a real exciting horse to to have for opulence and to have in the camp here. Yeah, and I mean, uh, the weather forecast at the moment, it's largely dry, doesn't it? There's one or two showers around, but we've been hopeful for a, a nice weather ascot next week, which would be good for him, for sure. Um, Tindrum Gold is another one. I mean, did he maybe need his first run at Thirsk? Well, he definitely needed a run, and uh, we learned that he, he really didn't enjoy the firm ground at Thirsk that day. I, I don't regret running him. I think he needed to get out and get his season started. He needed a third run before he was eligible for a, a, a high-level handicap. Um, we've entered him for the Britannia Stakes on Thursday. Now, he's a little bit opposite to Lee Special and Azure Angel. He would love it if um, if there was rain around and the, the track eased. I think he's a horse that uh, uh, his participation might be in doubt if a track was to be riding on the firmer side um, but he's a lovely horse he's got a similar profile to azure angel in that he he won two races last autumn um on the all weather um i think he's got masses of potential he's only had three lifetime starts so his best days are, are ahead of him um, whether he fits a mold um as a britannia horse we'll just have to see as i say i think you'd need uh, easy easy turf conditions um, to be really effective in a race like that. Um, but if we do line up and run, I think he's very capable and he'd be an exciting runner for sure. If he doesn't, he's a horse with plenty to offer over the summer months. So he's an exciting prospect regardless of what happens next week. Yes, hopefully he'll sneak over the bottom there and yeah, for him a bit of rain. Mitt Bahi, I thought, ran really well in the Temple States the other week, just being on the wrong side of the track. Are you optimistic about his chances in the King's Stand? We're really optimistic, yes, and uh, you know, well done for picking him out because uh, you know that weekend at Haydock, uh, the stands rail was really a, a you know hugely favoursome. And Mick Barhi came from a low number, and I thought he finished best of all the horses who race middle to to far side. Um, we went into that race um, sure he would need the run. He was a little bit heavy on the scales, so he'd strip much straighter, uh, fitter, and sharper on Tuesday at Ascot and I think the stiff five furlongs of the Ascot track um, will really suit him. Interestingly enough, a horse that he beat at Newbury in a group three of a world trophy at Newbury last um, last autumn, Manakan is only eight to one for the King's stand and I think Mitbar he's about 25 to one. So, you know, I, I think he'll outrun his odds and uh, I think the race is open this year. So we're very excited about running him.
Indeed, no, I'm very excited about his chances. Um, I did notice a Maynard sneaking in, been uh, dropped up in the uh, Duke of Cambridge. How how has she been getting on? Because obviously that's a long old layoff since the Guineas last year. Yeah, she's a really smart filly. Um, I'm a little bit 50-50 as to whether she'll go to Ascot. We've left her in the race. Uh, she's due a, a, a meaningful workout tomorrow morning. That would tell me if we're going to take our chance at Ascot. Um, if we don't do keep an eye out for her. Um, we might have her engaged in something like the Falmer Stakes at Newmarket's July meeting. Um, we'd be very ambitious about our plans with her. She ran very well in the 1000 Guineas, which was her last start last year. So she hasn't run for over a year, but she was sixth in the Guineas. Um, but a real eye catching run that day. She missed a break and she was really finishing almost best of all. So she's a filly with a, a real big summer ahead of her. We'll see how ambitious we are starting off with her. Um, tomorrow morning will tell me a little bit more whether she's going to be an Ascot, part of the Ascot team, but she's a lovely filly to keep your eye on. For sure, for sure. And of, of all your handicap chances next week, I imagine Perotto is right up near the top. The horse you just picked up at, I mean, imagine what in the winter time. Did he, when did he turn up at your yard? Yeah, he came to us in the new year. Um, mm. He ran very well, I thought, in the Victoria Cup, which was probably a furlong short of his best. Um, maybe he needed a run as well. So I think he'll be bang on uh, his racing weight for the Hunt Cup. Uh, he's got course Indeed. and distance form, having won the Britannia for Marcus as a three-year-old. It's a very tough race, as you know, but he's a hardened uh, campaigner. Um, I, I always uh, I think there's value in course and distance form. Uh, usually in a hunt cup, you need to be around a bit of pace and draw on the right side. At the moment, we don't know where that's going to be. Um, but, it, but it would be a lovely race uh, to get on the CV. And we're excited about running him. Brilliant. And Eldar Eldarov as well for the Gold Cup. Um, that must be, I mean, probably one of your shortest price runners of the week. Um, must be really excited about getting him back in the Group 1. Yeah, he's a lovely horse. He's done us proud, really, you know, winning at a Royal meeting last year and then winning the St. Ledger. I loved his run at York in the Yorkshire Cup. I thought that was a lovely comeback run and a very good trial for the Gold Cup. It mm -hmm. looks an open division. It uh, doesn't mean to say that's it, you know, makes it any easier. Um, there'll be plenty of runners and uh, plenty of staying horses in opposition that we'd respect. But I think Eldar's profile is uh, uh, highly progressive. And um, hopefully he'll run very well next Thursday. Indeed, indeed. Exo Planet ran really well in the London Gold Cup. I mean, always a very, very hot race that. And he made a, a lot of late headway down the centre of the track. Uh, do you think he was seen to best effect that day? Well, I think he ran a, a, a big race on the figures and a little unfortunate not to come home with a prize. He was drawn 16 of 16. We had to give him a chance early. Um, you know, he made up a heap of ground in the straight and maybe yeah. just, maybe just got a bit lonely on the outside. Um, but it was still a, a, a big run. Um, he's got the two options. He's in the Hampton Court Stakes on Thursday, the group three over a mile and a quarter. And he might have an entry for the handicap over a mile and a quarter on um, Saturday. Um, so he's got two options. He's a really talented horse. I don't think we've seen the best of him yet. He hasn't yet raced on a sound surface, and I think when he does, um, you'll see an even better horse. Fantastic. And King of Steel, King Edward bound, is that is that the plan at the um, moment? Potentially. He'll be left in the race tomorrow. Um, he'll be in conversation with Kia and the, and the ammo team over the weekend. He's obviously got other options as well, but the King Edward uh, certainly hasn't been ruled out. We've been very happy with him since his run in the derby. And, um, you know, we sort of make our mind up uh, where we're going with him over the next 72 hours. It must have been some thrill in the derby. I mean, a very kind of difficult but exciting watch the last two furlongs there. I mean, that, that was, uh, I really thought he had it there for a long time. And I imagine you did too. Yeah, big, big thrill to be involved in a race like the derby. Yeah. Um, and uh, a heartbreak in not to bring, bring it home, especially mm -hmm. for a split second did we all dare believe we probably did but i uh, clocked ryan more on the winner you know fairly early in the straight so it was only short-lived uh, the possibility i suppose but no it was a bittersweet moment but on reflection you know um, 
the sweet outweighs the bitter. We've got a lovely horse in our hands, very talented. He came out of a race well, and we're excited about him. And last by no means least, of course, Sakir. Are you confident that Combat Cup is the right race for Sakir? Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, confident as I can be. He looked very good over six furlongs last year. The Guineas was a race to put a line through, and perhaps we should be having another go over a mile on, on better ground. But, um, you know, he looked devastatingly good over six furlongs as a two year old. I think the six furlongs at Ascot, you know, the stiff six furlongs will be right up his street. And, um, you know, for that reason, we're excited about him. I did note in his Mill Reef last year, this kind of sectionals he was clocking would be about 12 seconds, 12 seconds. He gets into a lovely rhythm in his races uh, compared to a horse like we were comparing to Noble Style on the podcast, which is a horse that runs very much with a choke out and seems to want to go a lot quicker than that. So mate, I, I was still hopeful that he might, he might get a mile um, later on in the season. So I'd love to see it. Uh, I hope you try it again one day. Um, and just the final question would be any two-year-olds you're, you're thinking of running? Just one this year. We've got a lovely filly called Jabara who uh, won at Newmarket um, two weeks after the Guineas meeting. She won a, a very good filly's maiden over six furlongs. And that's the same race that Daea won before she won the Albany for us a few years ago. Oh yes, uh, yeah, I think it's the same race that Morge won last year. So historically, it's a strong mm. filly's maiden. Um, Jabara... Uh, won really nicely. She too was in action on the water gallop this morning, worked really well. And she's a filly um, that we're excited about to run in the Albany Stakes on Friday next week. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time, Roger. That was that was really informative. And uh, I wish you the best of luck for next week. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks again, obviously, to Roger for coming on the podcast uh, and speaking to me earlier this afternoon. Obviously, a lot of very interesting things that we learned there ahead of next week. Jack, do you have any takeaways from what Roger's just told us there? Yeah, there was a few things there. I'll, I'll need to watch it back. I've only watched it once, but there, there was quite a few. I um, thought it was interesting that King of Steel, judging by the way Roger was talking there, it, I wouldn't be certain that he's going to run. He obviously said that he needed to, to speak to Kia. Um, the suggestion is that I wouldn't put him down as a certain runner just yet. I thought he was very positive about Mitbar He, your point about on the wrong side, and he seemed to think that was a a, a fair fair excuse for that run. I I do think Ascot's going to suit him down to the ground as well. So that was an interesting one. Um, Exoplanet, uh, a horse I quite fancy for the meeting. So it was it was good to see a positive vibes again from Roger there. Um, there was a few things that he said that I hadn't even really thought about. Again, the wide draw. Um, it's interesting, though, he could he could go for the Hampton Court or possibly the handicap. So I would have liked to, um, him to come down either side and just kind of gives a bit more of a steer. But um, no, it was a, a thoroughly interesting interview there and lots of nuggets for, for the week ahead. Would you run him in the handicap or, or the group two? I would probably run him in the in the group uh, the group three. Yeah, the, the Hampton three, Court, I it? think. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's probably yeah. where it where he should go. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Right, lads. So, yeah, I think, Tom, we should carry on, shouldn't we? Start with Tuesday. Should we? Yeah, that, no, probably the best place to start. Absolutely. We'll on the, uh, the, yeah, the biggest group ones of the year in the Queen Anne Stakes over a mile. And obviously, look, we've said already, it's, it's a massive shame that Maljum isn't taking his chance. I spoke to Maureen Haggis uh, a couple of days ago about the horse, and she said that there's nothing massively wrong with him. He's just not quite right. And hopefully it won't be too long before we see him again. But obviously, it's been since Royal Ascot last year, the last time that we did see him. So, fingers crossed, Maljum can get back to uh, full fitness at some point in the near future. But him aside, it looks uh, an intriguing renewal, possibly not the classiest we've ever seen. But that said, we've got a Lockage winner in Modern Games, a very smart filly in Inspiral, and plenty of others in there as well. But it looks to be between the front two in the market, and they're pretty much the same price as well. Joey, do you see it going to, to one of those two? I'd see it going to Modern Games over in Spiral, personally. Um, I didn't quite like the way she went at the end of last year, you know, so she she looked very consistent at that point, won all her starts, and then she just, I can't really forgive her at that price throwing in some more than ordinary runs. 
um, especially on the final day. I thought she was really disappointing. So I think being asked to take what well, around the 15 to 8 I'm seeing on Raising Post at the moment is just, it's far too short. I would prefer modern games. I went round and round of this race. I thought it was nigh and impossible. Um, if I had to back one, I'd wait to see the draw. I'd like to see uh, chinned it with a high draw. Um, a similar sort of uh, kind of buck out in front, get the rail if they kind of drift over. I think he might be the sort of horse that could just win a fairly average renewal of the Queen Anne. So that would be where I'd be at, but it wouldn't be a race to be interesting me. And it just as a wider point for the week, I do think you have to be careful with your stakes at Royal Ascot. They're hugely competitive races, all the form lines coming together. I think there are some races that are really appealing for a bet, but some you should just leave alone. And this is more in the leave alone category for me. Yeah, I'd probably agree with you. I would also agree with Chindia. I think he would be the one for me at the prices each way, possibly. Um, he is... I, I, I like what Richard Hannan said about him before the season started. He said he'd really grown into himself and become a stronger horse as a five-year-old. And therefore, I think those two runs that he's produced so far this season have been in keeping with that assessment. And that second behind... Yeah, I could... Go on. Yeah, I can see something. I something. Do you remember Circus Maximus is Queen Anne? You know, that sort of thing where they kind of came over to the rail and like, you know, if you got a nice high draw and could just kind of lead and dominate the race from there, then you might, it might be. A, yeah. I mean, I've talked long. I've talked too long about a race. I don't have an opinion on Jack. I can see you're, you're desperate to get in. Uh, not too much. I, I, I actually just want to echo kind of all the points you've made there. It's not really a betting proposition. Um, Proper of the race, like I, I, I see it between the top two. I think if you want a bit of value, I think Kinder is probably the one as well. Um, Cash probably isn't good enough, as I mentioned last week. He'd be another one at around twenty-five to one. But I'd probably, as as you said, Joey, I'd probably favour modern games of the two. But it's just a race for me to sit out and yeah, move on to the second race. I think. Yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> so cracking starts the meeting, but we move on. We'll discuss the commentary a little bit later on. Let's go to the King Stand, the group one over five furlongs, the flying five furlongs. Cool and Gatter, a very interesting raider from Australia taking part in this contest, but the favourite is Highfield Princess. We also got Dramatised in there and Frankie the Tory riding Manakan as well. And a few others that are worthy of note, of course, Mitbahi Marshman as well. Clifford Lee and Carl Burke teaming up with that one. I'll kick off with this. I think Highfield Princess is the one to beat. Uh, very impressed with her last year, obviously. You could not be winning the Nunthorpe Thorpe in fantastic fashion and then going to the Curra in soft ground and following up in, in great style there. I thought her reappearance over six at York was absolutely superb behind Azure Blue, who is an improving mare herself. And for me, dropping back to the five furlongs, a stiff five at Ascot as well. I think Highfield Princess in this race that wouldn't be the strongest King Stand ever contested would definitely be my pick in the contest. Jack, what do you think about this? I don't think there's very much to add to what you said. I agree with all of that. I think she's the strongest favourite of the week of, of these these group ones. I, I really fancy her. It's, it's not a vintage renewal, and I find it very hard to beat here. Uh, the Australian horse is interesting. She won the same race that Nature Strip was second in last year. So obviously that's a form line that might be interesting to some, but... I just don't think she's as good as him and Highfield Princess and an absolute rocket. And yeah, I fully expect her to win. I think five to two is a very fair price. Yeah, two for Highfield. We're going to make it three with Joey? Certainly am. Um, yeah, no, I think she, I, I agree with Jack. I think she's probably one of the strongest favourites of the week, if not the strongest. Um, I I mean, I really like Mitt Barhi and I was very encouraged by what Roger said and the linking form lines to Manakan as well, who I think is another very solid each way. Um Proposition. The only other one I chuck into the mix would be Moon Easter. She ran really well in the race last year. She's going to be a huge price on the day. Get some extra places. You might chuck a couple of quid. But again, solidly Highfield Princess. I think this is one of the favourites to be with for sure. Only a bad draw could put me kind of thinking I'll have a have a bet on one of the ones better drawn that I've just mentioned if they were to be so. Yeah, really interesting point about Moon Easter there. Big price uh, for that one. But uh, yeah, big uh, positives about Highfield Princess in the King stand. Let's move on then to the mile contest on the opening day. The St. James's Palace Stakes Group 1. An absolute belter in store with both Guineas winners lining up against each other. Chaldine, of course, and Paddington, winner of the Irish edition. And then, of course, we've got Cicero's Gift, who's been so impressive in three starts thus far, particularly so at Goodwood last time. And then further down to Mostabshire, who bolted up at York. And that form now looks extremely good with the second and the fourth both winning well next time. Joey, a really good race this year, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's a really good race. It's a really good race. You usually get a couple chucked in there, you know, that kind of rustle the pot, don't you? Like to kind of change it up a bit. You know, you're always tempted to kind of go a different way. Um, it's hard. I mean, uh, it's hard to look away from Caldine. Uh, he's, he's a really, really likable horse. I just get the feeling. I get that it depends what the ground's going to be like on the first day. I, I have the feeling that watching his Dewhurst back, I don't think this horse really, really likes quick ground. Uh, I think he will always appreciate a little bit of cutting it. He was bouncing off it. And I think that's what kind of allowed Raw Scotsman to really get at him late in the race there. He's just not fully enjoying it. So if the ground were to come up re like relatively quick, but the first day it's likely to have a little bit of juice in it, which will give him a decent chance. I, I just, I'm inclined to, I, I really like Cicero's gift. I really do. He's just, it's the price is long gone now. If you're not on that, you're not on that train that's long gone and you know you can really crab his form can't you and you also look at his pedigree and you wonder he, he if it kind of becomes a bit of a cruel and a sprint i, I can see here that really suiting him but i can also see mustabshire personally kind of uh doing a similar thing to york as well getting out in front kicking off that bend and being quite hard to run down um so yeah i i i'm gonna i'm gonna be uh with mustabshire on the day but i can i can fully see why people would look at Caldean and say he's going to be hard to beat he has the best form in the race you know sometimes just don't don't argue with that to be honest Jerry I'm absolutely with you I think Caldean is going to be a little bit vulnerable if the ground's really quick I think he needs a bit of cut and um, his best form so far particularly the Guineas last time soft in soft in the going description so for me Caldean would be at his best with a little bit of soft ground underfoot so I'm going to go with Cicero's gift in this actually I was blown away by his performance at Goodwood last time he went to so many notebooks with that effort I know the runner-up that day didn't get the clearest of, of passages through, but Cicero's gift was so visually emphatic. And to me, he looked as though he has the turn of foot to really put it up to, to proper Group 1 horses. And this is a race in which we have seen the Guineas winners beaten in the past by horses coming through. And I think Cicero's gift could be just that. So he'd be my pick in this race. Uh, Jack, are you with one of those Guineas winners or Cicero's gift or indeed Mostabshire or indeed something else? Yeah, my, my opinion probably hasn't changed too much from last week. I'm very much in the Chaldean camp. I just think he's a class above these three-year-old Colts. I, th I think it's a fair point about the ground. I think a horse that has shown such a high level ability on soft, he probably would prefer that. But I think any horse would get away with very fast ground first time. Um, it's, as Joey said, there's probably they're going to leave a good print on the first day. So I wouldn't have too, too many concerns. And yeah, as I say, I just think he's a class above these. Uh, I think Mustard Share would be the, his biggest threat. I, re, I was really impressed with him at York, and as I said last week, I, I'm not a believer in Cicero's gift. I, I just, I just don't rate that form at all. And on pedigree, I, he, he's it's a speedy pedigree, isn't it? Mm. From what I can remember, but I, I, I think, I mean, even at the prices, Mustard is the one at the moment that would would be the one if you're going to go with one of those ones that doesn't have the real top class form in the book. He'd be the one for me. I mean, Paddington's nearly favourite now, isn't he? I mean, they're right up there, to in and fro, and I couldn't have that. I think Caldean's got much better form. I'd be with him over Paddington, but Mustabshire, I'd throw a few quid at him. He'd be my selection. Yeah, that form's worked out so well, hasn't it, from that race at York? Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to the Duke of Cambridge Stakes, Group 2 over a mile. Joey, start with you for this one. And Jumbly, the 2-1 to one favourite, so you've got to have a massive chance. Got to have a massive... Got to have a, got to have a chance. I mean... I, I don't want to say it too loudly because um, I won't get dinner here if I do because uh, <laughs> my girlfriend here broke her in. Uh, but I don't think she's that good. Uh, I don't think she deserves to be this short. Like, I, yeah, I really do have to whisper it. I, I don't think she's that that good. Um, I think she's a, she's a very nice Bonnie filly. I just don't know if she kind of deserves to be as short as she is for a race of this nature. Like, for example, I think Laurel has more raw ability than she does and I mean I wouldn't be trusting her after last time I mean me and you Tom were both very strong on her weren't we and yeah. uh, we got we got burnt um uh, other than that in the race it's I, I don't think again prosperous voyage is not one I want to I want to row in with I'd be interested if Grand Dam went here she's a filly that I really like I do like Grand Dam uh, of the two Gosden ones I, I'd, I'd be I'd be leaning her way but it depends if she, depends if this is what they go for they might go pretty poly or something like that um later on and skip this entirely she's not jocked up is she so um no she's a but she's a she's a filly i really like grand dam um i think she you know she was unlucky in the um sun chariot last uh last year where she got checked at a really vital time in that race and i think she would have been right there with fontaine and uh, laurel at the line so no she's one I'd, I'd be keeping a real eye out for 
but um yeah so that'd be where i am at the moment i'm i, I wouldn't be having jumbly personally at the prices i, I know jack's a, a big fan but i don't know if jack would you, could you back in her at nine to four well, having put her up at 10 to 1 on the Racing TV article and then yeah. last week at 6 to 1 each way, certainly very yeah. short now. I, I, I can't understand how, how she is so short. As you mentioned, the Laurel, th these are Group 1 performers. Prosperous Voyage is a Group 1 winner. So, yeah, 9 to 4 now is very, very short and I couldn't touch her at that price. I would just mention Queen Aminatu, who probably is a, an all-weather tool, really. But um, she, she was second at Ascot last season and I think... That, that all weather form does transfer well to the Ascot straight track, particularly. And at 20 to 1, I think she could be an interesting one for sure at a, at a bigger price. Yeah, I've always loved Queen Aminatu, particularly on the all weather. She's in the past shown a, a wonderful turn of foot on plenty of occasions, I have to say. And uh, she's certainly got ability. I think she's the kind of filly that needs to be delivered at absolutely the right time. But of course, Tom Mark Wand is the man for that. I've not got a huge opinion on this race. I think Laurel is an absolute unit when she's on form. The one that I would like to mention, she might well go for the Kensington Palace and it's probably the most likely aim for her. But if she doesn't, uh, she doesn't have a huge amount to find, in my opinion, just light ship with the, with the best of these. I mean, she's rated 100. She's got kind of seven to eight pounds to, fi to find with the rest of these. But I think we're yet to see the best of her. And Kevin Philip Adafoy, I saw him a little bit earlier in the season. He was very complimentary about this filly. And although she was put in her place by Laurel, towards the beginning of the season. I think she is progressing, getting better and better. And you can absolutely discount that run last time out because it was heavy ground. She doesn't want that. She wants top of the ground. And I think hopefully back on the turf on quicker conditions, she can prove that she is uh, a group one or group two filly and deserves her place in that kind of company. So for me, Lightship is worth keeping an eye on. She might well go for the Kensington Palace, as I say, but if she doesn't, 66 to one could be a, a really nice price about her. So keep an eye out for Lightship. Right, the second day of Royal Ask at the Prince of Wales Estates. It certainly makes the race a lot more open. Luxembourg, at the time of recording, is just about favourites. Brian Moore and Aidan O'Brien. Adiar closely follows in the market. Then Bay Bridge and also my Prospero for Tom Marquand and William Haggis. Joey, a, uh, a good renewal this year and it's quite tight in the, in the betting. It's very tight, isn't it? Um, again, this is this this looks very tricky from a betting perspective now because uh, you lads have been snapping up all the value. I mean, is, that, is that Jack crashing my Prospero's price to this to this to this level? I don't know, but uh, um, it's got to the point where you, you know there's a fag paper between all of them, isn't there? And um, if, if I had to pick one that I I, I like the most, I I would be picking Adiar. Um, I think his two best bits of form have come on really quick ground and he hasn't actually had the opportunity to run on that again since i mean his king george run was the best of his life the only concern i've got niggling away at me is 10 furlongs you know 10 furlongs on really quick ground is that really going to be seeing him as a big horse to his best effect but i do think this year you'll see a, a, a monstrous adiar you know he's coming he's, he's fairly lightly raised five-year-old he's going to be at his absolute peak and like the monster that he is you know with that frame so he he he'd be the one that I, I would like, if, if I was just picking one to be the winner, you know, I think I'd be picking Adiar, ignoring the prices, which is obviously insane. Uh, but Baybridge, Baybridge obviously is the one that has just the slight bit of value for me for the same reason, to some extent, that we were saying about with Chaldean, is that how quick is the ground going to be? There are there are a few showers around that I'm seeing. Um, it's changing you know, day to day. It's, it's such so difficult to predict this weather out there with how hot it is. But there's plenty of potential for a bit of a shower or two and then at that if you're taking four to one at that sort of price that's a little it's a little bit bigger than the others and he, he's he's no by no means less talented than them but yeah Adi would be the way i'd start but again I, I just don't really think there's a bet in this yeah i i totally agree with you joe to be perfectly honest I'll, I'll go next i think there's no bet in this for me either i think luxembourg possibly after his, his win last time, he got given a fantastic ride. We all know that in the Tassels Gold Cup. But uh, that was much more like it from the horse. And similar conditions will be to his advantage, I think. And it's possible Ryan Moore might try and get that easy lead that he got last time. It might not be as easy as it was then. But it wouldn't be at all surprising to see Ryan try and get that uh, early berth. Jack, what do you think about the race? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting race. Uh, there's quite a few... Uh... Little form lines that you can get into. Obviously, the champion stakes at Ascot last year with Adi or my Prospero and 
Averidge who obviously won. He's then been beaten by Luxembourg last time. I suspect Richard Kingscott would want the, the race again. I don't think there's much at all between them. So you, you, your prices vary in two, twos for Luxembourg up to four to one Bay Bridge. I would just add a warning with him, as, as Joey mentioned. I'm not sure if he's going to run if it, it is very quick ground and no rain does materialise. So th there could be the angle where it comes down to six or seven runners that it gets tactical then. A little bit of juice, I think, if, if you are looking for a bet. I know, obviously, I put my Prospero last week at 8-1. to It's 7-2. to two. He's probably the right price now. So I, would, I wouldn't be touching him now. I think he's where he should be. But if there's any value, I think Mostadaf each way at three to one, uh, with three places at bet three, six, five, if you can get on with them. I, I could see if Baybridge comes out, could be six or seven runners. And I could see then maybe one of the bigger players bombing out. He, he would be the one, a pace angle as well, to maybe take on Luxembourg. Um, he could be the one who, who could just nick a, a third, third place, really. So I think my Prospero, I, I, I think I haven't changed my view on him winning. And... Um, I think Mossadaf could possibly be the one if you're looking for a, a bit of value sort of outside of the box, he'd be the one I'd kind of look at. But um, yeah, my only bet in the race is Mike Prosper each way on the post, as I recommended last week. Yeah, I can absolutely see that angle, actually, Jack. Um, one thing I would say on that race is that I spoke to Maureen Haggis a couple of days ago at Haydock. And she had that twinkle in her eye about my Prospero. I mentioned the name and she looked very excited. So I think she's looking forward to the race for sure. Um, he's a horse, she said, that, as we all know, is starting to get to that Group 1 level. He ran a massive race at Ascot last year, a nice prep run ahead of this race, stepping up and trip. It all looks pretty nice, I think, for my Prospero, and that's exactly what uh, Maureen Haggis thought. Right, the last race on the Wednesday is the Queen's Vars Group 2. Won't spend too long on this one, uh, but I, I would, I'll go first. There's a, there's a horse called Davideo who won at Newmarket in very impressive fashion. I was actually there that afternoon, and I thought he was... So emphatic. And I love the way that he hit the line over a mile and a quarter. Now, he might well not go for this race. He is also entered in the King George V stakes, which is a handicap. But I think he's good enough to take part in the Queen's Vars. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if Rafe Beckett decides to himself, I'm going to go for the mile and six contest because there's no doubt Davideo has got bags and bags of stamina. And I think he showed that at Newmarket by being up there in the van the whole way and then when anything came to him, he just kept finding more. So I'd be very interested in him if he went for the race. And he's around about a 14 to 1 shot if he does line up. So he'd be my pick. I know that Gregory is favourite. Jack, what do you make of the race? It's funny if you mentioned Davideo. He, he's actually on my shortlist for the King George V handicap. That's why I ex where I expect him to go. Um, Rafe Beckett won that race in 2021. I think Davideo is actually well handicapped. So I think he'll probably go there over this race. Um, in terms of this race itself, I'm I'm really interested to see where Circle of Fire goes. I think he could go in the Mile 4 race, the uh, King Edward VII, but I, I suspect he might just go here. And I think at 8-1, to one, he offers a bit of value. Um, I'm going to hold fire and put him up as a bet for now. I just want to see what whether he is actually entered in that tomorrow morning. But um, Gregory's an interesting one. He, he deserves his place at the, the top of the market. He's on the St. Ledger Trail. Very interesting that he's changed hands in the interim. I imagine connection, his new connections have played a, a pretty penny to, to secure him from Philippa Cooper. Um, it's very hard to pick holes in him. Um, but no, just looking at Circle of Fire, uh, his run at Lingfield, everything went wrong. He just It, it wasn't his track, not his surface either. Back on back on turf, I'm sure he'll, he'll be ready to run the race of his life. Roy Lascott, a winner for the King and Queen. Um, I'm sure Sir Michael Stout would love that as well. So I'm very interested to see where he goes. You'll be taking your proverbial hat off, won't you, Jack, from the comfort of your living room if he does the oh, business? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joey, what do you make of the race? Um, another one that's quite hard to make head nor tail of with um, the other races that, you know, as you, the, the races you've mentioned, there's a lot of them that have entries later in the week, um, making it hard. But I, I'm not I'm not particularly sold on on Gregory on this track, to be honest. Um, just how big and how quick, how much, he, how quickly he comes off the bridle. Um, I just when you swing round, you don't have much time to really get going um, round round Ascot. So I, I, I just could see something like Circle of Fire, as I say, that would just be a little bit classier that might might get the better of him in this. Just I think you know, you know, you just you see them swing round the bend there, and he he takes a bit of organising because he's such a big unit. You know, he's a big gangly lad that's going to come on. He's so lightly raced. I, I just can see something doing him 
for a bit of you know a bit of tone here it's just what what is it going to be you know I, I like I love Tower of London but I imagine he probably will go um for the mile and a half race uh I, I like Castle Way as well but and Circle of Fire is three I, I I'd be happy to take him on with one of them whichever any of three of them turn up on the day but we'll, we'll have to wait till we till we know more but those would be the three against a favorite I think you can take on I really do yeah, yeah, really interesting thoughts there, I have to say, Joe, against the favourite there, Gregory. And a, a really good point, I think, you make about the track as well. Um, let's move on to Thursday, and we'll talk about the Norfolk a little bit later on. So let's move on first to the Ribblesdale Stakes and some big news that was announced at the time of recording today, and that was that Alice Sefer has been supplemented for the race by John and Thady Gosden and currently stands around about 6-4 to four on, 11-8 to eight on for the race. She is going to take some some serious beating if she produces a similar performance to the one that she produced at Goodwood very recently. Blue Stocking is in there for Rafe Beckett as well. She's definitely got a chance of being in the shakeup, as has Infinite Cosmos for Sir Michael Stout. But to be perfectly honest, lads, the way that Alice Sifa won at Goodwood, it marked out that she was a, a proper Group 1 filly in the making, could easily shake up the boys later in the season, maybe even in the Arc de Triomphe. So if she's going to have those high and lofty targets, she will need to be winning the Ribblesdale Stakes and in pretty nice fashion as well. Joey, do you think she'll do the business? Yes. <laughs> yes, for me I as really well. Do. I, 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 backed, I backed Empress Wu the other day and I was like, uh, I had one of those horrible moments where you're thinking, oh, we're going well here, this is looking lovely. And then you just, you're out of the corner of your eye, you just <laughs> see something swinging that you're just like, oh no, here we go. <laughs> And it's just you know this thing's just absolute different level. Um, so yeah, that was that was disappointing. But yeah, say so I think she's class, absolute yeah. class. Couldn't couldn't agree more, Joey. To be honest, and Jack, I, I to be honest, I really hope you agree. I'd agree in the most part. Yeah, in terms of a betting proposition, that's what, that's kind of what the whole way I'm looking. Certainly in this race, and Blue Stocking would would be interesting. I'm not sure if she's going to run. The, the have sounded a warning. They could. It could go elsewhere with the ground as well. So, yeah, she looked class, didn't she? At Goodwood, the visuals were, were immense, like the way she quick and clear. And you just hope she's another good one, really, don't you? And yeah, in terms of this race, uh, it's it's just annoying that you can't kind of find an angle. And certainly on my part, and yeah, she probably just wins, doesn't she? I'll tell you what, what you give to be Jim Crowley, Batash comes along, then he retires, <laughs> Baid comes along, he retires, and then he's got Alice Sefer as well. <laughs> Pure class. Yeah, no, it, it, just to read Jim, he, he gets he, he gets a good line of horses, doesn't he? He's, he's, <laughs> they keep <laughs> exactly coming for him. Right. They keep coming for him. Uh, they yeah, do. Incredible. They do indeed. Uh, right, we've got to move on to the Gold Cup, the big race on Thursday. And obviously the, the place to start is with Mr. Jack Nickel, whose brother Adam trains Wise Eagle, who would definitely have an each way squeak. I think he's quite a big price myself at 33 to 1. Jack, I imagine you probably do as well. Well, I hope so. There's not too much to add from, from last week's video. I, I I was home at the time. Um, he certainly looks better in his coat from from five to six weeks when I saw him last. We haven't had the, the warmest of spring. And it's, well, as everyone in the country knows now, we, we've had a lovely two, three weeks. And yeah, he's really starting to look well in his coat. By all means, he's had a smooth enough prep. And yeah, we're, we're just ticking down the days now and would be delighted with with running the, the top four or five. And it's just amazing to have a runner at actual at, at Roy Lasco. It's it's a it's a dream come true. And as I said last week, you go you you you're dreaming of, of possibly winning the race. I think both of us uh, wish you the absolute best of luck. You know, there's friendly rivalries and all this, but I don't think we'd like anything more than Wise Eagle to run an absolute belter next week. So best of luck. Thank you very much. At flat out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if he if he wins, like I don't know what my reaction will be, but I won't be able to contain myself. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think we've we'll seen Jack at work for a few weeks. Like... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I booked annual leave off, um, just just in case the, the the miracle did happen. I'm back to work. I think five days later, so I think there's a big enough gap if we did actually win for me to get back to work in time. In in all seriousness, Jack, I, I, look, I, I hope he I hope he does win, but I do think. In form terms, he has got a lot to find with, with Coltrane. And as far as I'm concerned, I think Coltrane is the most likely winner of the race. He's got no stamina issues, really. And he seems to be... He might not be an improved performer necessarily this season, but he's not got the, the calibre of rivals that he's had to take on the past couple of seasons this time. 
So I think the race is there for, for his taking, really. Uh, Jack, do you, do you think that Coltrane would be the biggest danger to Wise Eagle? <laughs> biggest danger? Well, I think he's the, the most likely as winner breaking the, the race down. I think uh, Courage Monami is, is, well, he is the unexposed one. I think he's very interested in the fact that Gosden historically hasn't been afraid to to chuck one in if they think they're good enough. So, well, he's, he's kind of the wise guy's selection. What we know before his injury is subjective. This is, well, I, I saw Charlie Johnson in an interview there yesterday. He he, he was the world-class there. He he could be the pace angle in this race. I don't see too many pace angles, and he could just get a freebie again. It, it depends, though, whether he is still the same horse. Um, if I was having a bet, I mean, I've only backed Wise Eagle up. I don't really see this race as a betting proposition for obvious reasons, but I think subjectivist at 10 to 1 probably would be the, the standout bet for me at the moment. I think Coltrane's probably the right the right price. Elder Elderov short enough. It's interesting that, that Roger that w- was confident on his chances. Good luck to them. Emily Dickinson, Broom, Yabia, Echoes and Rain, they've all got question marks. Trushan probably doesn't run, but yeah, come back to it if you put a gun to my head now, I'd probably say subjectivist. Taking any loyalties aside would probably be the, the each way shout. Okay, nice one. Yeah, I, I would like to give a mention to Courage Monami as well, who I did put up last week as a, a really interesting runner, considering he was given that Aston Gold Cup entry after his second win, which is very rare for the Gosnes to do something like that. Um, but he is going to run in the race. He's quite short now. I think 8-1 to one for a horse that three starts, conversely, is, is a fairly short price. But obviously, Frankie Fever and all that and he's very unexposed. Joey, what do you think of the race? I I, I can't help but feel, it may be harsh on him, that Coltrane, if if he wins, you're just a little bit underwhelmed by it. I just, you know, if, if, you, if you're going to have a year, right, where something, a horse like Courage Manami is, is half as good as people kind of suspect he could be, this is a year for something like that to happen for me because it's mm. just there's so many question marks against the others. So you, you, you're not if you're one of these kind of lurking inexperienced ones, um, you've got an opportunity to win this. You really do. You're not up against a hell of a lot. I, I couldn't help just looking at the weather. I couldn't help having and I know I know people will laugh at that looking at the weather. It's been sunny. I couldn't help having a, just a few quid the other day on Shan, just because. There is that chance that thunderstorms happen. There is that rat. It's just got that feel of it out there. It's got that sort of like horrible, like <laughs> muggy, uh, might rain. It just might rain. And if he, if it rains, if there's a little bit of juice in the ground, he's just, he's the, he is the best. He is the best there in, in this race by a long way on ability. I tell you what, if, if the soft ground comes, Joey, I'm with you. Like, yeah, I mean, and, he's. And, that that just for everyone, that's a fun bet that I couldn't resist. <laughs> but that is not that is not advice. That is not advice. Um, um, maybe that's not a good safe gambling message. But I did have to have a few quid just for a bit of fun because I just could I could just see it happening. Well, I mean, we've got we've got to have thunderstorms. I mean, they've got to come. It's been it's been too hot not to have them. So at some point, it could be just in time for Thursday for you. Do it's it. how it ha- it's how it goes every year. You have two weeks of hot weather, and then it rains. And what, what, when does the two weeks hot, hot weather end? Almost exactly the time the Gold Cup's supposed to start. <laughs> See, Love if it. that's not shrewd punting advice for all of you out there, I don't know what you tune in for this for. Absolutely. Um, I do, just on that note, I do think uh, Courage Mon Ami is, is wonderfully named. And um, yeah. it, I think it's, a, it's almost a slogan that we should take uh, into this podcast really ahead of Royal Ascot. Courage, my friends, <laughs> try to pick out. <laughs> seriously need it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll need it with some of these selections. <laughs> we shall. Which brings us on nicely to the final race on the Thursday, which is the Hampton Court Stakes Group 3. And I'm delighted to see that Torito is a likely runner. He'd be my selection in the race with Benoit de la Sayette given a really big ride here by Jonathan Thady Gosden in the George Strawbridge Silks. I was most impressed with his victory last time at Epsom. And I thought the Hampton Court, we, Jack and I spoke about this actually in person, would be the most likely destination for him stepping up to group company. Raised £10 by the handicapper. He's off 105 now, with likely the best to come. And uh, he's, he's really interesting for me at, over that mile and a quarter trip. And I think he's going to take some beating. At least I hope he will. Uh, Jack, what do you think about this? Yeah, it looks, uh, just looking at the race, yeah, it looks a uh, fantastic renewal. It's certainly going to be a stronger race than the, the mile, mile four race. Exoplanet, as I mentioned earlier, he's... He's a horse I really do like. I think he probably could have won without kind of breaking the stride, jumping the bit of litter there at Newbury. Um, again, he could still go for the, the Golden Gate. 
obviously we spoke about Torito last week, huge fan. It was such a good performance. I'd say we're quite far off his ceiling yet, and he could well be a proper horse, a proper a group one horse in time. So very interesting that Benoit keeps the ride. Frankie obviously rides Epictetus, same owners. You would suggest that he, on his last Royal Ascot, would, would, would obviously get the choice of all of them. So certainly on the form, you think, oh, well, I might switch over to Rito. He's the one that's improving. Epictetus has been quite disappointing so far this year. I, I would see that as a, a small negative for Torito. Surely Frankie would flex his muscles and say, look, I'm going to ride the better one. So, yeah, it's enough to put me off for now. I'm going to wait for deck, see what happens. Okay, uh, of course, we've only got these are provisionals. This doesn't mean that Frankie and Benoit could yet swap. So, yeah, I think it's best to wait for now. Exoplanet, I'm interested to see where he goes. I do actually hope he comes here. Um, well, I don't know. Yeah, he could be, could be a handicap horse. I don't know. I'm I'm not sure. I'm waiting. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait. Okay, nice one, Joey. What about you? What about me? You say yes, Sorry, indeed. What about me? What about me? Indeed, I I will, I fancy Wipero in this. Uh, he's dropped up just even with Tom Tom Marquand. I actually think he ran a sneaky, really, really nice race in the Derby. Uh, that's kind of crying out to see him drop back down to ten. He fired a, a furlong there that was seriously quick when it was hot, hotting up in the derby like like a proper 10 furlong horse. And I think the way he quickened around the bend after military order at Lingfield suggested again that he could come, come back to 10. So yeah, I, I, I'm gonna give I'm gonna row in with him. I'm gonna give him a give him a squeak in this. Okay. For all I respect stuff. your selections, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. But I do think wipero has got got a big race in him this year. Yeah, I would agree, actually. I think uh, you know, that run at Linkfield was great behind military order. Um, moving on then to the Friday. Let's start by looking at the King Amber, the seventh stakes, a mile and a half race for Group 2. And it's for these contenders in the derby who are taking over a slightly longer trip, unlike Waipiro, who's dropping back. And King of Steel is 6-4th to market lead off that fine run to be second behind the derby winner last time out. I'm going to stick with Alder here. At around about 10-1, to 1, I have to admit, and you're both going to laugh at this, I've had a couple of quid each way on Alder 100 to 1 for the arc. <laughs> um, but I thought, you know, I thought, why not? Let's have, a, let's have a little bit of a punt on order for the arc. I think he's really, really good. And we didn't see him to best effect at all at Chester last time. That was in soft ground. He's been spared a race ever since. Comes here fresh. I always like that angle in the King Edward stakes because you haven't got that run in the derby that has kind of exhausted you out. Whereas uh, he comes here a fresh horse. So I'm hoping that all the can do the business for Donica O'Brien and give him a nice Royal Ascot winner. Uh, Joey, what about you? Well, just before, Jack, if you had to buy one of our bets, Trushan in the Gold Cup or Older for the Arc for one pound, you got it. <laughs> which one would you buy for a quid? Well, you're not going to like this, but I probably would take the Older bet because I'd uh, say he's more, he's more likely to win uh, yes. than Trushan. I mean, it's, it's like a road out there. You might as well have got a magnifying glass with with this sunny weather and just put it up to your money, do it. Well, to be fair, we were all we we're all saying that you know there's going to be a li they're going to water it nice and liberally. There's a few showers in the week. They might get an inch earlier in the week. And even Kingy did say on his interview that they'd run him if it was good ground. Fair enough. So, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe that's not stupid. stupid. I just back to this right. I think this is this is very hard. I mean, what what's going to run? What is going to run? Um, but no, I do. I, I like older as well, to be honest, Jack. Uh, to be honest, Tom, I really do like older, but it'll be a token selection. So over to Jack. To be, to be perfectly honest, Joey, I'm delighted to hear that, uh, to get you on the older, <laughs> on the older train. Uh, Jack, very like, very, I've got a toe on, I've got a toe on the older train. I've got a toe. That was a, <laughs> yeah. It was, a, it was a very tentative toe that went on the older train there. I've got, uh, I've got my Achilles heel on there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jack, what about you? Well, just li just listening there to, to Roger earlier, it, it doesn't sound like they're completely committed yet to this. And if he is out, then it's blown wide open. I think probably connections of Circle Fire waiting. He would be my absolute selection if, if King of Steel came out. I think if King, King of Steel runs, he just wins. That, that being said, it was a good point you made. The, the Derby runners to come here, it doesn't have a great record. Um Military order could be an interesting one. I wouldn't be surprised if they find him up on the bend at Epsom and get him to Ascot in time. He could he could have a squeak yet. Um, arrest's not going to run. But no, Circle, it's it, it's, a, it's a race to wait. But Circle Fire, if he doesn't go for the Queen's Vars and comes here, he would be my selection. 
Okay, lovely stuff. Let's drop back to a sprinting distance then for the 420 on the Friday. That is the Commonwealth Cup, a series of horses who are dropping back in trip. One of those being Sarkir, Little Big Bear, obviously having a win at the Sandy Lane last time. And we've also got Lazoo, Shaquille, Noble Style, and a few others as well. Jack, what do you think? Do you think Little Big Bear is the winner of this? I wouldn't say he's the winner, no. I think he, he deserves his place at the head of the market. I know people are probably thinking, oh, look, he got the, the kind of the golden highway there at Haydock. I think he, looking what he did as a two-year-old, he was the, the, the standout juvenile. And it was good to see him do that and come back and, and, and see that form. It, it would concern me a little bit that the, the, the proximity of should have been a ring to, to him. So with that in mind, I, I, I've always been a, a big fan of Suki. He blew, blew me away when he won the mill wreath there. Bear in mind, I think Varian had seven winners on the day. He probably around the stable cat and it would have won that day as well. He's probably around the right price of four to one. I mentioned him and Lazou last week. It's very hard to pick curls in her. She, she's a course and distance winner, group one winner. Beckett's very pleased with her in the interview that he gave as well. So if pushed, I'd probably dutch those two, Sakia and Lazoo, and, and, and back them over Little Big Bear for all that I, I find it hard to pick holes in him as well. I think it's a great race. I've got a docket still sitting on Noble Style. He probably goes for the jersey. I'm hoping that he probably might. Charlie might think, oh, well, let's let's come back and give him one more more, more go. I'm not sure Shaquille's good enough. I, I, but then again, Noble Style wasn't good enough to beat him at Newbury. So what chance have you got on that there? Yeah, I, I think Shaquille might be good enough, to be perfectly honest. And I love the fact that Julie Camacho's horses are absolutely flying at the moment. She's operating at a 30% strike rate with her horses. And Shaquille just keeps going from strength to strength, from York novice to Wolverhampton novice to Newmarket class two handicap to Newbury last time out in the Carnarvon Stakes. And I think uh, this could be the one for Shaquille. I, I love the way that he runs. And I think the track will suit him really well, as will the trip. Jerry, what do you think? I love, I love bit, Little Big Bear. I mean, obviously, he's it's, it's just got fabulous form, hasn't he? I mean, um, I think uh, people will be out to get him a little bit as well on the day just because of the fact that everyone, it was so well documented how there was a golden highway that day at Haydock. It would be one of those things where maybe people go a bit too high, a bit too heavy on that. Um, but um, I, I, I would be with Jack. I mean, obviously, I'm also clinging on to a noble style anti-post docket. But um, I, I think it's one of... It, People are always like, I've seen comments about him like not training on and that sort of thing. He ran an absolute cracker in the guineas, I thought, for a horse that wouldn't naturally clearly want that for me. And this would be the perfect six furlongs for him. But he ran at Newbury just like the sort of performance that you expect sometimes from sprinters that have been told all the time building up to a race, calm down, chill out, hang on to you, relax. And then you suddenly, you're trying to get them to relax, trying to get them to relax. And then immediately chuck them back into a six furlong sprint where they've gone absolutely bananas and he's been left behind out the back just a little bit you know caught on his heels and then he doesn't quite kind of come into the race you kind of you calmed him down and then you're asking him to go again so it's one of those where it wouldn't surprise me it seems to me that ascot would be the perfect six furlongs for him you know that little bit a little bit of little bit of a rise in the final furlong that will just kind of help him as well, maybe not be of the absolute crack sprinters, you know, the real five felt and he wouldn't be able to drop quite back to that. I think six and a half would be perfect. That's essentially if it was a flat track. And so six at Ascot's perfect. But it seems, as Jack says, they're going to go to the jersey. But no, other than that, little big bear. But I, I do hope Noble Style runs because I really think he'd have a right chance. I think you made some really good points there, Joe, to be perfectly honest. That was a, a yeah, a, f a fine summation of the action in the Commonwealth Cup. Um, the last Group 1 on Friday and the final group race itself is the Coronation Stakes over a mile for Phillies. And look, for me, I've got to say, chaps, I think this is the race that I'm most looking forward to the entire week. I think it's an absolute belter. We've got Tahira, we've got Morge, reopposing, of course, from their 1,000 guineas battle royale. It really was something special to behold that. Meditate coming back, of course, from her defeat behind Tahira in the Curra last time. And then, of course, you have Queen for You, who is a very unexposed contender for Jonathan Lady Goldstone. And let's not forget the La Pomparia duo of Jana Rose and Kalina. I'll kick off to hear her for all that she stays a mile. I don't think she stays a mile quite as strongly as others do, including the likes of Morge, perhaps Meditate. I think she's very classy and she's got away with it so far, particularly last time out at the Curra. 
But if it turns into a test of stamina, I think she's got too much pace and I think she'll flatten out, just as she did, in my opinion, a little bit at Newmarket last time, or the time before last, when she was defeated by Morge. I think she's a proper six, seven furlong horse and she beat most horses in training over that trip. I just feel over a strongly run mile, I know it's around the bend, but I think possibly Morge and Meditate might just try and make it a test of stamina and that might just see her a little bit vulnerable. So I think one of those two could potentially get their own back. Jack, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting point. I'm not on, on breeding. Tahira should absolutely stay further. Meditate. I'm not sure. I think she should come back and trip in time. My angle here is that the more I think about, it, I do quite like Queen for you. I think it, well, she she should have won the last day at York, and it, it was actually watching Philippa Cooper in an interview after Gregory won a Goodwood there the other day, and she had such a, a twinkle in her eye about the way she spoke about her. Obviously, I imagine she's had hot offers possibly the same connections with all Gregory in, in the interim. and it, It's just sort of written in the stars. And the way she spoke about it, I think, at eight to one, and she, she's actually come, come in for a bit of support today. She's into a short as five to one in place. I think at eight to one, that's that's the bet at this point. Here are short enough for me. For all, I do think she's the most likeliest winner. Um, at eight to one, queen for you, though, I, I really struggled to see her out the three. I'd have stamina doubts again about meditate. For all the quick rounders, what she wants, I think, Seven, the the pre Jean Pratt. I'll come back to that race again, Tom. Very and good. The race for her. I probably butchered it again, so I no, apologize. Did. That was tremendous. Very good. I I'll get there eventually. And more, I, I just think back, looking back at the Guineas, she had the benefit of, uh, as Saeed said in the race after there, that she'd only recently in the last two three weeks come in off Dubai, had a, a warm weather training camp to come in. Probably caught Tahira cold a bit. I, I'd fully expect her to comfort, co- con- reverse that form, sorry, and confirm the form with Meditate. But yeah, Queen for You is the, is, is the one that I could see maybe sticking it up to her, you know? Already proven to ask it, of course, is Queen for You. Joe, are you, are you a tier hero or something else? Well, I mean, again, I could not really from a betting point of view, but just as a just a wider point, I I don't necessarily agree with you about Tahira. I mean, I think her, her, her breeding, she should stay. I think she's just very, very classy. Uh, I think she, you could, I think she could probably win a top level race over ten as well. I, I, I wouldn't think it's an issue. I think she's really classy. I think the the main issue about the Guineas run, as I said at the time, she, she, her coat looked pretty average. You know, she was the most clearly backward in her coat one of the of the lot, and she still ran an absolute belter that day. You know, really started off the flat season, didn't it? That 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 contest, I thought that was fa- fantastic race, and she was just—I don't think she was quite ready. And then she goes on to the Irish One Thousand Guineas, and that's probably come a bit quick for a horse that gives a, that's just given an absolute massive effort when she's not quite a one, and so she's a little laboured. And so, I you 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 may you if you did have a concern, it'd be like is she is is she due an off day after two? after finding good performances when things aren't quite in her favour. Um, but she's a filly that I really, really like. So um, I I wouldn't be desperate to take her on. I do think Meditate will be much better round a bend. I, like Jack, think she'll end up winning a, winning at group level, a seven furlong race eventually. I think they'll they'll end up going back and trip. But I do think if she's ever, if she's going to win one, she's going to win one, it'd be something like today where you can go around that, fly around that bend and then kick and a bit, a bit of turn of pace and then cling on sort of thing. Maybe. But no, I'd be with Tahira. Okay, lovely stuff. From the mile, we drop back to six furlongs for the Queen Elizabeth II Jubilee Stakes on the Saturday. Group one race. I can't really make head nor tail of this other than the fact I can't wait to see Sacred run again, who is a mare that I absolutely adore. And she was so impressive at Lingfield last time in group three company. And Jack, I know that you adore her as well. Yeah, I absolutely love this filly. I'm praying that kind of the rain that is threatening with these thunderstorms does stay away because she needs it. The quicker, the better for her, really. And yeah, I don't want to repeat too much of what I said last week, but um, just, well, saying that now, that the, the, the betting has changed. She is now into about a price I mentioned around about the 8-1 to one mark, which I think is about where she should be in the market. The 5-1 the to one to 14 disparity last week between her and Notorious, certainly on last year's run, was too, too big. She's probably found her place in the market now. You just have that in your back of your mind now that if there is any rain on the day or the day before that you'd be worried because, as I say, she can't have it any quicker. Um, Al Sahil as well, he hasn't changed in price, so I, I would still recommend a, a solid bet there each way. 
uh, to a similar angle of Nadal Crown last year. Fair enough, he is he has ran over six furlongs before in this country, but I think he's just turned himself inside out this winter. And um, that that run in in the Alcor Sprint last time, he looked like he was going to go and win by three lengths. So I'm hoping that you know history kind of repeats itself there. The bookies have kind of cottoned on to to kind of what he did there, what Charlie did there with Naval Crown last year. They're not going to give you 40 to 1 this year and 14 to 1 is probably about right. And for all he's a bit of a nutcase, I think he, he's just supremely talented, isn't he? And if it's going day for him, he could just carry all these before. Yeah, I'd really like that point, to be honest, Jack. And uh, it's got a bit of an international feel to it this year, hasn't it, the race, Joey? Certainly does. It certainly does. And um, I, I, I always, you always, I think have a little bit more trepidation when you're looking at international runners in these sprints. Um, it's probably our, probably our weakest weakest area. And I'd be looking at a horse like Wellington and that being the big threat to me to a horse like Sacred, who I, I also like as much as Jack and you, of course, Tom. But I'd be looking at him. I mean, I think some of these these sprinters from abroad, they're just a little bit a cut above ours. And so, you know, with his form, probably behind one of the best sprinters in the world over there in Hong Kong, uh, I'd probably be leaning towards Wellington if I was having a bet. Okay, lovely stuff. Wellington for Joey, if he was having a bet. Uh, the last group race to talk about at Royal Ascot next week, or this week coming, is the Harwick Stake, the Group 2, over a mile and a half. Uh, just a quick point of order on this race. I spoke to William Muir about Pile Driver a little bit earlier on in the week. He's obviously been off for nearly a year, and he said to me, this is likely to be a bit of a prep run ahead of the King George. So I wouldn't be too enthused about him winning the Hardwick Stakes. For all that, of course, he has got Group 1 form in the book. Hookem is the favourite, second in his free wind. And then we've got Dovior Legend and a few others down further in the betting. Joey, who do you fancy in this, if anything? Um, I think this is a really, really nice opportunity for Hookem. I really do. Um, yeah, I won't add to too much more than that. Um, really like Hookham. Um, I think he back over back over mile and a half. I think that's probably where he's at his optimum again. He's another one. He got his season cut short last year. That five year old season, these big horses like him, when they really come into their own, is when they're about five. And uh, I expect him to really, really take high order this year. So, yeah, no, I'd be with Hookham. Okay, nice one. I'm going to go with Free Wind. I think she's a, a filly very much on the upper mare, I should say, now at five years old. And I love the way she won last time. And I think she's a proper classy, classy mare. So in receipt of three pounds from Hookham, I hope that she can just see him off in the closing stages. Uh, Jack, what about you? It's, it's probably a race I'm not going to get involved with, with to be honest. You, you'd think as Bayeed's big brother, I'd, I'd be all over Hookham. He's such a, an admirable, admirable horse and it was such a good performance there to beat as a crown after a serious injury as well. But at around seven to four to two to one, I, I'd be happy to set that one out. It'd be interesting if Rebels Rebels Romance runs. He's around fourteen to one, sixteen to one. I'm not I'm not sure if he's going to run though. That is the problem. So, yeah, I think for now I'm just going to wait for Dex, and it's one for sitting out for me. Okay, lovely stuff. That brings us on to the end of the group races at Royal Ascot this year. Now we're going to go into some other business. And we're going to group together quite a few races in this, them being the Norfolk, the Coventry, the Chesham, the Jersey, the Windsor Castle, and indeed all the handicaps as well. So anything that the, the panel, including myself, thinks is worthy of note from any of those races, we'll get to now. Um, Jack, should we start with you for this? I mean, there, I imagine there are a fair few, but could you kind of whittle it down to as, as few as possible? <laughs> well, it's probably best to just start on the juvenile races alone. Um, over time, I've probably, well... Uh, from my own personal point of view, I I should just avoid the two-year-old races. Is where I come under each week. Um, of course, relief rally. There's always two or three that catch your eye in the build-up and more out sport and bets that you kind of follow the whim. So relief rally, obviously, as mentioned earlier. But Barnwell boy, I was just blown away by him at Goodwood. Um, he came so close to to beating Royal Scotsman's track record, which he which Barnwell boy did on debut compared to. Royal Scotsman, who did it on his fourth start on quicker ground. So it just suggests that, that it was such a remarkable performance. He shifted to his left, greenness and inexperience. Um, so, yeah, for me, I think he will... Well, he, he was entered in the Norfolk today, so I'm still wondering where he's going to run. He's going to be a, a bet for me. I, I, I just love that that performance. In terms of other two-year-old runners, I think, um, as I mentioned last week, Devious was a horse I was really impressed with, mm. but Nace... Just the, the way he did it over on the far rail there uh, was such a good performance. Donica said the next day that 
they, they, they'd almost been thinking of him for the Coventry as well. So to have a horse that you, you hold in such a regard to run in a race like that. So he could well go for the Norfolk, which is now actually shaping up to be the race of the week with a sad map possibly going there over the, the Coventry. Um, obviously, American rascal and, and elite status as well. What a race that, that could be. And I'm sure I'm forgetting one or two of us. Uh, Noche Magica, does, does, does that go there as well? So like, what a race that, that we have in prospect there. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I'd want, love Joe, to give a, I'd love to give a, a shout out for Nachi Magica as well. Was a horse I I really was taken by in the Marble Hill. I thought that you know from the way the horse travelled through the race and did that just smooth headway and was hit the front just a little too soon and then they got run down a lot from got felt the kind of the pinch from making ground really quickly. I thought that was knock your eye out stuff. So I'd be really interested in him wherever he goes. Uh, he's one I really like. Um, of the others, Barnwell Boy as well, and with Jack, I just that was just I thought it was fantastic. Um, so wherever he goes, I'd be really, really interested in him. But those those were the two that stood out for me. Um, there's a there's a whole host, and as, as Jack says, I think you, you really this is the area where you have to tread carefully, tread carefully at this stage. But those would be the two for me. Okay, nice one, Jack. Anything for the uh, anything else in the, uh, the meeting and the handicaps? Yeah, quite a few handicaps. Um, so I'll go day by day. Um, Ascot Stakes calling the wind. Uh, his his form figures at Ascot read one two three two three. He's been second and third at this meeting in the Queen Alexandra, which is over a slightly longer trip. I wonder. If Don't I know it, Jack? Good. Don't I know it? I've been I've been, I've been on in the last couple of years, and well, I thought he was going to win both times. Third time's a charm, bully. Third time is a charm. I'm thinking <laughs> slightly shorter trip. They've got Billy the Kid Lochnan up. Um, 16 to 1, it, I, I'm so annoyed. I saw him at 25 to 1 there the other day, just after entry. Rightly so, he's been shortened up. I could see him going off single figure. So at 16 to 1, I think he's a solid enough each way bet. Um, Richard Hughes has had three winners so far this month. He's in good form, which is obviously a great sign. And yeah, I think he's a really solid uh, each way bet in the Ascot Stakes. On the same day, I think Get Shirty is a really interesting horse. Um, obviously, won the race last year. He sneaks in here off one of five. He had a, a pretty listless display there at Haydock the other day, but I think that was by design just to, to get him to sneak in there. He's dropped to get off a mark of one of five, so he does get in the race. Um, if you look back not so far ago, his third to Silver Sonic carries anything in this race. I mean, Vauban obviously could just be chucked in, of course. Um, and again, I wouldn't put anyone off, as last week I mentioned there, for him for the Melbourne Cup. But yeah, just come back to get you. I think that could be by design. 25 to 1, I think he, he is a really interesting horse. We know he loves the track and look for each way each way back, as I could again see him being the one for support. Um, moving on to the Royal Hunt Cup on the Wednesday, I would stop short of um, putting a bet up at the moment, but there's the three I um, really like. Um, Gawley is an interesting one. Um, he gave how much he gave nine pounds there to King of Conquest when we last saw him last year. He's obviously a really talented but fragile horse. Um, I read in the week there that he is on track to run, so around the 12 to 1 mark, he's interesting enough at the moment. Um, Milbosk, um, see, so he's he's only had one run for William Huggs, but the previous connection is he was third in the French derby behind Sir Marks Basilica. That's that's top class form. It's interesting enough that William hasn't run him this season. I wonder if he's just doing a candle fad. He's he's who won first time up last season, and he thought, right, we're just going to go Royal Hunt Cup. Let's this is a long ridge target getting cherry ripe for this. He's interesting enough as well. Blue for you as well. Um, he would be on the list. But um, for now, uh, I'm, I'm going to stop short. But those would be three on the short list for that anyway. Um, moving on to the Thursday for the handicaps, the King George V. Um, mentioned Davide earlier, Tom. I know you you like him for the, the stakes. Right? I think they should come here. As I mentioned, well, Beckett. Just, just to interrupt, I, I, to be honest, I'd like him wherever they went. I just hope sure. that they go the, for the mile and three quarters just because I think he'll, he'll love that trip. Mm. Well, I, yeah, as mentioned earlier as well, Beckett won the race in 2021. He kind of knows the type to, to come and win the race. I think he's well handicapped still. Um, he was so impressive at uh, Newmarket, wasn't he? And uh, I, I, again, as you said, I could just see him. He could be, be a bit about bit of value there. There's interesting that Aidan O'Brien runs Bertinelli um, over the King Edward the Seven. Um, I think Tower of London goes there instead. I think we probably expected the the two to go in different directions. Um, so he would be he commands the utmost respect as well. I, I really do rate that London Gold Cup form. 
Um, the Britannia is similar to the, the Hunt Cup. I'll stop short um, of actually putting up a bet. There's, there's three or four I like in that. Sir Yob could, again, that, that could be a group force and a handicap of 88. There's going to be another 10 in the in the, in the the race that you could put in the same bracket. Um, Royal Cape and Naxos would be two that would be on the shortlist for that. They're more likely to go for the Golden Gate. Um, at the moment, there is one I do like, which is Benneke or Ben Aker. He, he disappointed in the, the German guineas there just a, a week or two ago um, for Johnson's. But we know that these horses can bounce back. They just need to run them all the time, you know, and he, he could definitely re, re-find his form pretty easily. Off 96, again, um, the fact he went off favourite for a classic um, suggests he's probably still went handicapped. And at 25 to 1, I might just, you know, have a little bit now. I, I expect him to run and... Yeah, I would actually put him up um, as a recommendation for now, thinking about because he could well go off nearly half that price. Um, one for the Buckingham Palace would be Northern Express. Um, I think he could be underestimated purely just as it is a Northern trainer. He's a well, he's won over a mile on soft in in the first gun cup already this season. He's obviously in top form, but by all intents and purposes, he wants quick round. If the, the quicker the better in terms of the the pace of the race as well. So I think he's an interesting one enough at sixteen to one. I've backed him already. Um, I would keep an eye out for Star of Orion. He seems to have turned a corner. He's shown a bit more form this year. Fair enough. It might be hard to reverse form with Montese, but at ninety a rating of ninety two for Star of Orion, he'd be one to to kind of look out for. Um, and yes, yeah, so my best two handicap bets. I mentioned them last week. There still isn't a market for them. We're waiting. But I expect Clon Mackin to, to run in the Sandringham. Johnny Murder won the race with creative belief a few years ago. The same race he, um, that Clon Mackin ran in last time at the Pro was what creative belief won there on the way. She was really unlucky. She got bumped at a vital time and a, a lesser horse would have gone back. The fact that Clon Mackin stuck on and very nearly won the race, I think I think she is a stakes filly. Um, she has an Irish mark of 92. I expect that obviously he'll go up a little bit. Um, but she's very much at the top of my shortlist. Um, Embrace for Owen Burroughs would be another. I'm interested to see if she's entered tomorrow. And um, sorry, uh, a third handicap bet I do like uh, before I move on to the best handicap. Um, in the Palace of Holyrood House, Conquistador of George Bowie. He's had two starts for him, um, dropped him back to spin trips, and he, he, he looks a, a revelation really for Bowie. I believe this has been a long-term plot. He's rated off 86. They've protected that over the last few months. Um, he'd be a really strong fancy. Um, so as soon as the market comes out for that, I'll be taking the prices for, for him. And um, the, the strongest handicap bet of the week is knock breaks. Um, just wherever you look with his form, it, it's it's top class. I was actually, well, I say top class, but very strong handicap form. I was expecting him to go for the King George, but... Um, I did note that Charlie Johnson sounded out that he could drop back in to 10. So the fact he wasn't entered in that suggests now he does go for the Golden Gate and he would be a standout in that for me. Um, his form at Pontefract would be Perfuse. Uh, and third was Crystal Mariner. He then went to Haydock. He was beaten by Gregory, who we know could well be a... a well, he is a, already a group performer, isn't he? Won the list at Cocktat and he's got bigger and better things ahead. And the third horse, if not now, he's went and won at Sandow. Just wherever you look with this horse, it, it, it's really solid form. Obviously, we, he then went to, to York. He was a little bit keen. I think Andrea maybe slipped him a little bit too much rain. And, um, interesting enough, he could just be coming back down to 10, and that might just be the making of him. It could be his best trip. And, yeah, for me, he'd be the best handicap bet of the week. But as I've just rambled on for the last five minutes or so, there's plenty to get stuck into in the handicaps. And I think this is where I'll probably make the money this week. Joey, over to you. Well, I mean, I, I, th- <laughs> I think we've all got to get on, haven't we, lads? And all the viewers have probably got lives to get back to. So we'll probably, I'll keep it, I'll keep it short with three, with three punts that I'll be putting up, essentially, my three, three better bets. Um, my, be- my best bets so far would definitely be Cadillac, I'd have to say, in the Wolverton. I think, you know, he ran seriously well in this race last year uh, behind Dubai Future, who put up a just ridiculous performance. Just uh, he's, he's capable of nonsense like that, Dubai Future, isn't he? Like, just, he's so, he's got a lot of talent, but it shows it once in a blue moon and uh, ran really well there. 
I thought his performance at Epsom last last time was just mind-boggling stuff. You know, the, the way Kevin stopped, had to like hoop the whole field, put up a huge number coming from the back there. It was an incredible performance. Uh, he comes in here, and I just think it, it was a similar break last time between the two races. So I don't have any worries about that. I don't worry about the ground, the cheap pieces he took so well to last time. You know, it was in Blinkers last year where we saw massive improvement. The cheap pieces are working just as well this time around. And we come into this race and I'm looking at Francesco Clemente at the top of the betting. I mean, he's just, to me, the sort of horse. If you go back and watch him last time, he was more interested in biting King of, King of Conquest than he was than actually going by him. Watch it. Watch it. He literally is, like just like Chindit knew did. He's looking at him, going, I'm going to have you rather than go by you. He, w- he wouldn't be one I'd be interested in. Saga, you don't, don't trust him. Buckaroo, one good performance in six. Uh, Bolshoi Ballet, not interested. Kingdom of Conquest under a penalty. Uh, you know, he, he probably run well, but I, I really fancy Cadillac in this. So yeah, it'd be my strongest bet, I think, of the week so far. Um, of the handicaps, I think Perotto is just an absolutely obvious one. Really, really obvious. I really, really like him. You know, it's, it's a real trainer upgrade going to Roger. He had a right sighter at Ascot last time. Uh, I backed him for that. And, uh, you know, it just looked like the kind of We'll just happily take this, have a nice run, see as well. He's got great Ascot form, back up a furlong is really going to suit him. He's hard to look away from, I think, in that particular contest. And the other one would be Lear Special. Lear Special is also really like, and I just think over seven at Ascot, I think it's go, he's got plenty of uh, juice left in his mark at 97, exactly where you sort of want to be for this race. And I think he's early hundreds kind of rated horse. So I, I as with all of Jack's concerns, you know, like reiterated, you know, all of these things are heavily reliant on the draw and, you know, exactly like you never know really halfway through the week, we'll expect the where you want to be drawn on the straight track to switch. So there's all sorts of concerns that we have to put our hands up to. But no, those would be my my three strong fancies. Lovely stuff. Hopefully, Leah Special can give our sponsors opulent thoroughbreds a nice winner at Royal Ascots over the course. That would be good. It would be great. <laughs> that would be yeah. good. Uh, I'm going to put up three as well. Um, I'm going to go with Elite Status, who is my banker of the week. I think he's an absolute machine. I was at Sandown to see him with the national stakes. He quickened up three times. I've only ever seen that in one horse, and I've said that a few times in the last week or so. <laughs> it was two times was... last week. It's three times now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was twice that you could see markedly quicken, and once in a yeah. tiny way. Um, so I'm calling it three times. Um, but the only horse I've seen do that was Pantra Celebra when he on the Arc de Triumph. I think it was 1989. Uh, not that I'm comparing him to Pantra Celebra, but it was um, it was something to behold. It really was to see him coming so far clear in what was a, what looked a really hot race on paper beforehand. Um, so I think he'll take a hell of a lot of beating in that Norfolk Stakes, even though it looks like a really hot race. I think he's a serious tool. Um, and then the other two, both in handicaps, I'm going to go with Intelligent because it exactly describes what I'm not in the Royal Hunt Cup uh, for Jane Chapel Hyam. Ran a massive race in the in the contest last year, finishing second, beating half a length off 105. He's off 104 this year, so dropped a pound, which might give him that half a length uh, to get his head in front. And um, he ran a pretty good race, I thought, at Newbury last time in prep for this. He didn't get the clearest of runs, was only beaten just over three lengths at the line. Definitely would have been a, a closer, and there's no doubt he's been trained for this one. So intelligent for me in the Raw Hunt Cup. And then my best handicap bet of the week would be in the Wokingham on Saturday, and that would be spy catcher for Carl Burke. I think he's got an absolutely massive chance in this race uh, for High Clear. He's a horse who ran a huge race in the Victoria Cup over seven furlongs. He was on the side that Rebel Territory was on, or the Rebel Territory ended up coming into the, towards the middle of the track in the end. He was so far clear of everything else. But he finished second in his group on that far side. And I think dropping back to six furlongs is going to be exactly what he wants. He's probably going to be a pace angle in that race. And I think that's going to suit him again heavily reliant on the draw, but I think that drop in trip is really going to help him to finish off his race most potently. And I think at 25 to one around about that mark, he's a really big price is spy catcher. So I can see him running a huge race. He's a, he's a proper progressive sprinter and hopefully he can uh, land the big one in the working stakes. Gents, that was a, a proper go through the, uh, the Royal Ascot card. So thanks very much. It was a lot of fun. And hopefully we got some winners for you all at home in there as well. Just to remember, please do gamble responsibly. Gambling at the end of the day is supposed to be fun. And when the fun stops, please do stop. But that is it from us. Royal Ascot Week, one of the most glorious five days of the year. I cannot wait. And I'm sure Joey and Jack are exactly the same. So please do enjoy it all. And hopefully we've pointed you in the right direction for some winners as well. Thank you.